The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Net Wealth Investments Limited, ABN 85090 569 109, AFSL 230 975, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Advice tech. As if it wasn't enough to be across TMD's Alpha Beta, Rule of 72 and all the other nuances of financial advice. Now advisors are expected to be across all the technology options too and there's so many of them. But never fear, Peter D is here. Join me each week on a journey of discovery through the software and apps on offer for advisors and advice businesses. So let's dive in, fellow advice explorers. This podcast is proudly sponsored by NetWealth. Imagine a world of investment choice that goes beyond borders. Open up a world of investment opportunity with NetWealth, where you can access local and international securities, as well as bonds and foreign currency options for wholesale clients. Offer your clients flexibility, transparency, and efficiency with managed accounts, managed funds, and access to non-custodial assets. A world of investment awaits you. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. Hello and welcome to the Ensemble Advice Tech Podcast. I'm Peter Diamantidis and joining me here today to deep dive into Word and Excel, would you believe, because we've had a lot of requests for this. So I've brought in somebody who's neck deep in it on a day-to-day basis. She's worked for the Department of Defense. So, you know, behave. Um, she's been on, uh, been an advice business para planner and a practice manager, is now a practice development consultant at Scale Up Para Planning. Thank you so much for joining me on the show, Katie Sajak. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Not at all. Now, I'm a bit excited to dive into this because I think this is one of those topics that we all underrate how little we know. But before we do that, Let's get to know you as a user of technology. Okay. What's your most used emoji? Do you even use emojis? I do. I do. Um, my most used emoji at the moment is the, the clapping hands. I just feel like I'm forever. I like cheering people on. And so nice. that's just, yeah, that's always on the talk, which is, which is a nice one, I think, to have on top. <laughs> oh, I think so too. I think so too. And it's it's far more age appropriate. What you, it's so funny doing this and we've actually collated everybody's responses and there's definitely generational answers oh yeah and yeah so boomers and gen x far more with the thumbs up oh yeah whereas that's even considered passive aggressive in the younger generation really i think so I it's didn't like, know yeah that. yeah i know right <laughs> um who knew with these one little one little emoji well and in fact i just found out that there's been a um a court case where a legal agreement was said to have been accepted because somebody responded with a thumbs up so the courts are now considering that as an acknowledgement can you believe that? i can't believe that Wow. Right. I know. <laughs> like, oh, no, that's just made me reconsider all oh, of my responses yeah. to everything. <laughs> I'm thinking of every time I've done a thumbs up, thumbs up now. Right. Now, most of the time I'm figuring it's probably not to your lawyer. No. Or to, to somebody's <laughs> lawyer. So I'm like, I've got it all. It's okay. No, exactly. <laughs> exactly. One lesson, one thing learned today, folks, listeners. Yeah, <laughs> no interesting. Thumbs up to legal contracts. Oh, dear. Now, the second thing we love to know about our guests is – we all live with our smartphones just permanently attached to us. But if you had to wipe everything off your smartphone and just keep three apps, which are the apps you'd keep? Interesting. So I would keep WhatsApp. That's, you know, the main part of motor communication with everyone I know, including, you know, my children. Um, mm-hmm. The second one, which my daughter said, please don't say this one, but I'm going to anyway, is Candy Crush, ashamedly. <laughs> um, I know, it's, you know, one of those really old school games and I don't, no. I don't play games, but it's my wind down time and I'm determined to finish Candy Crush however long, however many decades it takes me. <laughs> it's a bit of a personal challenge, but my, my children it. are mortified by this. Um, and the third one is an app called Amy. It's a, um, it's a generative music app. And so there's no playlist. Oh, It's just an app that um, like it just continues on and on and you can kind of control the composition. Wow as it's playing and so you can kind of fine tune it to how you like it. And I really like it when oh, I'm fantastic. you know, when I'm doing like you know, deep work and that kind of focused, you know, three or four hours at a yeah. time. 
to just have this continuous, you know, I find myself, in, you know, if it's Spotify, I can skip through 100 songs before I find the one I like. But yeah. this just will go on and on and then it will just, you know, slowly kind of evolve to the sounds that you like, that you listen to constantly. And I love it. It's a good one. It's, it's really powerful. I've... um. And I've actually had to remind myself to go back and start using it again. I've used Brain FM, which is a similar type yep. of thing. And it, it even puts a time frame on so I can say, hey, I need 90 minutes. Um, and now generally the only challenge is generally it's only like mm, rainforest music or, you know, dolphins yep. and stuff. So it, so depending on what your preference is, they're getting better. They've added a lot more. But I sound can make such a difference to how quickly you can get into that yep. zone. I couldn't agree more. Um, so I'm right there with you. I'm going to check that out. Actually, my head is down, audience. I'm just writing that down because <laughs> uh, I'm always looking for things like that because with so many distractions in our lives, we need everything we can at our disposal to sort of dial in, right, to really Absolutely. focus. All right. So let's dive into what we're here for, shall we? The very exciting and new wave apps Word and yeah. Excel. <laughs> so <laughs> there will be some of you listening who are thinking, Peter, what on earth are we doing chatting about this? But the reality is for most of us, we spend a good part of every day in tools like this. Um, and so it just made sense to actually take a good look at them because I think we probably don't give them the attention they deserve from a learning sense. So yeah. let's start with what they are. The category board broadly is, the, I mean, I think they call them productivity they tools. Are, yeah. Essentially, um, yeah. Which is sort of funny because it means something that's not in that category is not productive, I guess. So I find that category really funny. Yeah, and I, I, I don't know. I wouldn't What's describe cool? them necessarily as product tools as a – like an initial description? But no, it, it's weird, it's, but it's yeah. what they do. Right? So what they, when you see them in groups, yeah. that's what they call them. I do have an initial question for you. In in your experience and having dealt with what I'm embedding is quite a few practices, are most people in the Microsoft family, is, are many people going into the sort of the Google side of things as an alternative? It's interesting, actually. Um, probably in the past, let's say, four to six weeks, I've come across clients who are either in the Google suite or moving to the Google suite. Um, you know, up till okay. now, the camp has always, you know, the majority has always been in, in the Microsoft camp because it was convenient, it's easy, it kind of integrates into, yeah. you know, just about anything and everything. But there has been a notable shift to the other side. Um, mm, I'm not sure. Interesting. You know, and, and I actually have asked the question, you know, of people who have said it's a personal preference, you know, and some actually have said it's a productivity preference. Uh, but I haven't looked into it deep enough to be honest, but there is a mm. notable shift, I have to say. And I, look, I think <clears throat> for us, so our practice is a Google f practice, although we've had to get Word and Excel because there's just some apps that that's how yeah. it's going to come out. Um, and interestingly, uh, the uh, Google equivalent of Excel Sheets just isn't, it. it's not the financial analyst yes, that Excel correct. is. You know, it's sort of the more basic version. Um, so, you know, for that reason, we've had to use Excel for some things. But for us years ago, the decision was because Google being delivered online, so there's no local version or download, of, you know, like it's all online, meant that it integrated with more things yes. a lot earlier because it was online, you know, whereas Microsoft has got there, but it's it's it has, lagged. It has very much lagged in that camp and it's kind of catching up now and, even now, I find myself mm. still not quite used to that advancement. Like I'm still, you know, using the desktop versions of everything. You know, when someone says, oh, well, yeah. you just put it on OneDrive and, you know, you know it's it's not like yeah. an instinctual thing, you know. I, I still use the old-fashioned thing because that's what it's been for a very, very long time. So, yeah. Right. And I guess I had that question is, is, as far as you're aware, are there any material differences between the desktop versus the web versions of Word and Excel? Like, like does Excel have everything in the cloud version that it does on the desktop does, version? Um, but the layout is a little bit different. And if you're okay. used to the desktop version, I find that the cloud version throws you off. And okay. it's great for collaboration. Um, however, anyone with yep. a fancy spreadsheet won't want to be collaborating all that much because, you know, no. it's, it's data that once somebody tampers with it, it's, you know, you become very married yeah. to your spreadsheets. Uh, <laughs> oh, you do. Oh, uh, so, you, do. you know, you see somebody that is in Excel quite a lot and using it for complex purposes, I will say that the majority yeah. of people, and, I, you know, I could be wrong, but the majority, including myself, will yeah. use the desktop version for sure. 
desktop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think you're probably yeah. right. Um, and it, look, it's an interesting thing to, I, I should confess to uh, to the listener out there that my background prior to financial advice was in corporate finance and M&A and I started in that game as a financial analyst. And so we built these massive spreadsheets to work out the values of businesses yeah. and things like that. So it was, you know, instructing clients about privatising a government yeah. asset or whatever. And there were these massive spreadsheets and I learnt very quickly to lock down as yeah. much as possible of those spreadsheets because when somebody else gets their mitts on those things, like it can be be a two-day recovery process because your boss decided to fiddle with the something yep. or whatever yep. sheet and it's just but a I, nightmare. But I guess that's the beauty um, of Excel, you know, in general is that you can, be, you know, you can create something so incredibly complex, you know, which is why I say, you know, when you create something so complex and like you said, you, you, you know, you lock it down as much as you can, but at the same time, how yeah. cool to have this program where you can create these complex, you know, complicated like spreadsheets and calculations and run businesses on an Excel spreadsheet, you know, it's, it's yeah. amazing. It is amazing. And I guess that's, let's start with, so let's talk about Excel. So, look, and before we press record, we were just chatting about the spectrum of people that use Excel. Um, and none of this is judgment. This is just sort of laying out that, you know, different users use it for different things. And at one end, you've got the highly technical, probably uses a lot of formulas, all sorts of complexity in the sheet, really using that function functionality quite deeply. And probably even beyond that, there's some other clever stuff beyond that. But way at the other end are people that re- use it really because it's like grid paper. So it's really just the boxes and the lines and maybe some summaries. It's the layout really that appeals to them. Is it, is it encouraging, you know, from a layout sense? Um, and what I'm curious about what you see from advice practices, and it's not just advisors um, in this, do you see sort of experience across that spectrum in advice practices in terms of, of how they use Excel or what their yeah, experience vastly. with it is? Um, I've seen it used as a yeah. like a workflow management tool right through to really complex investment calculators, you know, and these things will be 20 sheets long in lockdown with, you know, really kind of intense macros and VBA in the background. Um, and, you yeah, know, okay. like you said, there are some people who are just using it as group paper who will just have a whole bunch of random calculations, you know, one plus three plus four. And, um, so really, yeah. um, it's interesting to see how it's been applied, you know, in so many different ways yeah. to so many different people. Yeah. 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 And it's, I mean, the the thing I'm I'm interested in too is, is would you, having seen that, if somebody's not an advisor or say a power planner who's who's I guess more likely to be in the uh, complex mm-hmm. calculation category, then do you think potentially there's a um, opportunity to get some more training in something like an Excel for even support so they better understand what these tools can do for them? That, that because there could be some things they're doing a hard way that perhaps using a tool like Excel and maybe even Word could just make that bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, obviously, there are those who, you know, have absolutely mastered it and, you know, well, you know, can create array calculations, yeah. you know, their eyes closed. Um, but there are certainly, you know, if you're somebody that does use it or want to use it, I don't know, for me, probably the easiest place to start is YouTube, is to just, or to just Google and just kind of go, how do I do yes. this and how do I do There are so many help articles out there. There used to be a lot of courses. I remember when I started in public service, there were a lot of Courses aimed at Excel oh, and things like terrible. that. They were, yeah, absolutely, they were horrible. And I think I've learned more yeah. from YouTube. Yeah, open file here. <laughs> you know, file new. Like, oh god, like I don't, I don't know. I'm not here for this. Uh, I know how to open a new file. I need to do the things after that, please. I think Excel can be quite intimidating because there is just so much. There are so many menu options that you know. I think 90 percent of them is just ignored widely because I don't know what that you know what that yeah. does. You know, it would be yeah. my suggestion to just start Googling, you know, what does this menu mean and what is this or what is that or how do I, you know, auto sum this massive table or how do I turn this into a pivot table, yeah. um, you know, and just have a play around. Um, like I said, there are lots of YouTube tutorials. There are lots of, you know, fantastic um, people who have dedicated channels on YouTube, Instagram and you know, all the social media platforms that yes. are dedicated to teaching people how to use the more complex areas of Excel. Um, short, shortcuts yeah. as well. I, I'm For a sure. big fan of keyboard shortcuts for Excel and Word. I have developed a massive library of shortcuts, um, you know, and anyone that knows me will know that S4 is my favourite, absolute favourite shortcut for everything. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, and just for those, so to cover off these, there's a few things we sort of, words we bandied around there and to acknowledge the fact that not everybody listening is going to be across those. So the shortcuts being, you know, the combination of two keys that will cause something to occur in say word or, or the spreadsheet and the opportunity I'm betting there is you can combine multiple steps into one sort of shortcut. Is that a, yeah. a yep. short way to describe it? Yeah, yeah. correct. Okay. Um, and then, you know, it just speeds up whatever you're doing um, and can repeat, you know, previous actions. So you're not having to, you know, repeat the same calculation or the same entry 28 times. Yeah. Yeah. Once you get used to shortcuts, they, you know, you, you won't go back. And it's something that's um, a sort of a, a newly learned skill, isn't it? Where watching what we're doing on a daily basis of the small repetitive things, yes. like really taking notice of those. And there will be a lot of those in both Word and Excel. Yep. You know, there'll be a lot of Huge. them, you know, yep. and, and, you know, for me, in things like Word, any sort of word processing tool, you know, the, you know, templating and, and um, the title types that like layout types and all those sort of things, I think people sort of think they know how to use, but don't realize how much repetition in fixing formatting they yep. apply on a daily basis. And it's crazy making that stuff. If you don't, yep. like you spend a lot of time doing something that really isn't really your job. Like you're not Correct. a you're not a word format. Like you're not a document formatter. That's not what you're hired to do. But we spend so much time doing it. Yeah, and it's um, it's not until you kind of sit down with someone and go, "Hey, did you know that you can just press this button here or press F four on your keyboard or whatever it is?" That people go, "Oh my gosh, I didn't even know that you know Excel or Word could do this." Yeah. Um, and so you know, sometimes it is somebody else pointing it out to you, and sometimes it's just kind of going, "Well, why am I doing this? You know, twenty eight times when I don't need to?" And yeah, googling how to you know. Make it more efficient, I suppose. Yes. So now there was another one. So you mentioned arrays. Just as a high level, what is that in Excel and what have you seen it used for? So what's the benefit of an array? Uh, So arrays are kind of for really, really complex calculations, you know, where you've got, um, you know, I've seen it, I've seen people use it for, um, you know, investment property modeling. So when it's, you know, when you've got really complex, when you're kind of calculating, you know, the potential of buying an investment property and should you and, you know, yep. what's yep. everything okay. that's involved, all the fees, you know, how will that look in yep. 20 years? You know, yep. well, what's your, what are your rates going to be? What's your, you know, rent going to be? How yep. does that all line up to CPI and everything else? Um, yeah, okay. It's not my area of strength, um, but yep. I have seen it used. And when it's for somebody that knows how to use it, it adds just a whole other layer of just incredible, you know, I guess advancement to what you're doing, you know, compared to or comparable to modeling in software that you see. Right. And I think that's an interesting thing actually we should probably touch on is is there are a lot of modeling tools out yeah. there. And yeah. so there is a decision, I guess, when we're using it for client forecasts and modeling as opposed to all the other ways we can use things like Excel, which there are many, is there's that decision between whether you use something that you like, you like design yourself um, versus using an external tool. Um, and for some people, you know, I mean, so for us, then generally we'll use an external tool, like something that's a modeling tool. Yeah. Um, the places we don't use that are when the modeling tool is too complicated and yeah. you need something much simpler because the 400 assumptions you enter into the modeling tool make the answer ludicrous. You yep. know, and so it's we're overcomplicating it. So, do you see? Are there still practices though out there that are using it for quite, you know, forecast modeling? Are still using Excel for that sort of thing? And how are they sort of keeping on top of that? Because clearly things change and update, and assumptions need to change. So, how are they sort of monitoring and keeping keeping up to date with that sort of um, use of Excel? Yeah, I, I, I still do, we do see it still. Um, yep, probably less as time goes on, but certainly, um, you know, I, I have seen. Gosh, it's been maybe five in this past year uh, where yep. they've used it, you know, I guess, yeah, in, in like, you know, for pure modeling because they don't want to use, you know, any of the major platforms, um, yep. you know, whether it be because they're not quite sure whether they can rely on the, the output or the, the data feeds or fees coming through or whatever, you know, the reason may be. Um, yep. What I have found with a lot of these is that the, the spreadsheets that they have are quite complex, but they're also quite old because somebody built them on my back. And so Originally. A lot of them become like a patched up kind of, you know, band-aided version as time goes yeah. on. Um, yeah. And then, you know, from that point, it's really, really hard 
you know, this is where I have the conversation with somebody who will say, you know, do I keep going with this? Or do I now move to a software platform? And, you know, how yeah. do I make that do what this does, this band-aid and beautiful thing that we've built for the past 15 years? How do I do yeah. that here? Um, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. There are still some very, very complex that calculators out there that are Cer- yeah. certainly I can see it like having we just recently sort of took a look at a whole lot of the modeling tools and yep. I think th- this doesn't apply to us but if your modeling is intra year mm-hmm. so if there's anything you're doing within a year or over strange time frames within a year yep. lots of the modeling doesn't cope with that it sort of looks at things in whole years yeah. you know or, or like it might do a portion of the year to begin and end but it sort of doesn't have any any concept of within the year. And so, for example, I can even see with certain cash flow modeling, I could see why somebody might be using Excel if they're trying to just give somebody a sense that's more like, hey, this is what the year, like the next 24 months looks like. It would be actually very difficult to do that in external tools because they just don't look at it that way. Correct. Um, So I can see that making sense. Yeah. To that end though, um, and I'm sure given you're seeing these tools that are built some years ago, potentially even – you know, built by somebody with a whole lot of interest, but maybe not any training or any sort of analyst training in their background. You know, there's probably some rules of thumb out there with using things like Excel. I mean, for me, one was always, you know, you should never have a number in a formula. Yep. So where where earthly possible, it's a field times a field divided by a field, multiplied by a field, plus a field. Correct. Like <laughs> it's all, the whole formula is about referencing fields, whether they're anchored so they don't move when you copy and paste them or not. Yep. Um, the thing I've seen go pear-shaped is when people have got numbers embedded into formulas. And, of course, that's difficult to find if you're trying to update a spreadsheet Absolutely. for something that's changed. Absolutely. And, you know, the the rule I was always taught, and this was going back to, you know, where I was part of editing the, the budget papers every year. Um, and that was, you know, complex, complex, you know, spreadsheets. The more general you can make it, the better. So, like you said, if you do have numbers, um, you know, if something goes pear shaped. It's it's a needle in a haystack situation. Yeah, um, and you don't want to be responsible for that. <laughs> yep. Uh, well, and it's so easy to. Um, it's human nature to go. Well, something calculated it, therefore it's right. Correct. Yeah. You know, it's human nature to do that. Yeah. So, we've got to do everything in your power to have ways to limit the possibility of just dragging a formula across and it messes it up because you didn't anchor the field right or you, you've right. got a number in it it's like it's and there's an extra day in that year like these things that you know every year isn't 365 days that's right so depending on the way you put formulas in that's going to go pear shaped like it's all those sort of things so yep. i remember like it got drilled into me when we were doing analysis like it's, it's as much as human possible humanly possible no numbers in formulas the other thing i'm curious about what you would say is do you um, prefer like your assumptions or the fields you're going to enter be on a separate sheet in that spreadsheet and then the calculations on it like a second tab say like what's your take on that or are you hey there might be some assumptions sitting up that somebody might fiddle, fiddle with and see it flow through below it what's your take on that um i would usually and i i would usually have really high level assumptions just really really basic kind of things where the calculations are but yep. anything that's you know quite deep that needs you know lots and lots of fields lots and lots of information or lots of updating always in a separate sheet uh, in a separate sheet yeah um, and my rule always is to hide that sheet so no one tampers with it unless you need to or unless it needs to be updated. Um, yeah. You know, but always in a separate sheet um, because if anything goes pear shaped here, at least you've still got this data, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's, you know, kind of just really basic input, age, retirement age, CPI rate, those kind of really, really basic kind of level things, if you just want to have a simple complication or calculation, sorry, always on the sheet where the information is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, cool. So while we're on Excel, why don't we we'll, we'll sort of focus on Excel and then we can go into Word a bit more. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned VBA. Yep. Some people won't know what that is. So just give us the like high level, what are we talking about there? Sure. So VBA is Visual Basic for Applications and mm-hmm. it's a very old programming language. Very old. Oh, it's it's like ancient. as old as um, me nearly. <laughs> It's like really, I remember it being there at uni. Oh my God, this is a really old program. (laughs) It is, it is very, very old. It's one of the very first um, languages that I learned how to code Mm. in. Um, But it's an area in the back of kind of the developer area in the back of Excel and and Word where you can manipulate um, the front end through the back end. Um, And it's also where you'd see if you ever recorded a macro. 
Yep. Um, if you open up the back end, you'd be able to see, you know, the series of steps um, in a different language. Yeah, okay. And so just to give people a sense, though, what what's possible using some of these tools? Like what have you seen built that's just really changed either? doesn't doesn't just need to be for an advisor or power planner within the business where somebody's really managed to get some great bang for buck out of Excel and make life easier? What sort of things do you see? I've met, I touched before on um, I've seen really, really, really complex uh, property modelling spreadsheets. Yeah. You know, um, and that's, you know, kind of modelling on existing properties and adding on extra properties and selling and retirement and super and what that whole situation will look like, you know, today versus 20 years versus retirement or whatever it is, uh, you know, and that's that's one of the most fantastic examples I've seen of Excel being used. I, quite a while ago, created something that I couldn't find a program anywhere that would do it, but I created a strategy filter. And so it's essentially this massive database of advice strategies Yep. That, you know, with just one little screen, one little spreadsheet kind of screen where you can enter in, you know, clients kind of basic details, where they're at, and then the VBA in the background would filter through all the strategies that are in the database and spit out and go, hey, these might work for this client based on what you've put in. Awesome. I've seen really, really complex workflows in there, like really, really complex workflows, you know, for you know, 30 or 40 people in a practice, um, you know. Managing. So meaning that they're using it to manage, like manage work in progress or Yeah, yeah, manage tasks. Okay. Um and so okay. it'll be, you know, quite granular and you know, task by task by task and what's the outcome of each task and where does that lead to? Yeah, and, and like I said before, that's what I love about it, is that you can use it for so many different things. Um and it just And takes so a bit is of that sort around. of almost using Excel like a database? Is that really what they've done there? Is sort of turn it yeah. more into a database. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. And I think a lot of people that's kind of the general where I see it's either they use it as a ca- as a calculator or they turn it into some kind of database and it works really well as a database. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it sort of was originally built alongside that, wasn't it? Like it was sort of one of those yeah. things that was like the first version of that for most people. Correct. Um, and what about things like um, – templating and look and feel. It's always been uh, something that's been a bit of a bugbear of me years ago. So my clients, when I was in, you know, advancement banking always, and the particularly ones that weren't finance people, so they're operational people used to love it because I would make to go to a lot of trouble to make things easy to read, even when you're printing off the spreadsheet, like really careful layout, highlighted cells, even some cells with shadows so it's clear, you know, which ones are fields and which ones are, you know, all that sort of stuff. Yep. Do you see many people setting up any templating or anything like that in Excel? Do you think there's any value in some of those things that could be better used? Not anymore. Not so much. It's more the question I get asked a lot is um, how do I print this nicely? How do I get this into a right. nice one page? That's always yep. the biggest question, which sometimes is near, actually a lot of the time is near impossible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, more so than, you know, how do I make this pretty or user friendly or anything like that? It's more just how do I get this to fit onto one page so I can show my client or right. email it to my client. Um, yeah, okay. So it seems to be and more is, about is that. that. Is there, do you think there's much of, I mean, for example, sending somebody a spreadsheet or is very different to sending them a one pager or a PDF or a, you know, a screenshot. What are you seeing people use in that sense? How what's the sort of um, normal behaviour for people when they're using tools that they then send the details to a client? How are they generally doing that? It's generally just you know they'll extract the information that they need, um, and you know it's just like a PDF to the client, just a one pager. Um, very rarely yeah, okay. do I see anybody send. The client, you know, kind of the raw calculations or the raw spreadsheets. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people yeah. just won't because, you know, the chance of something going wrong D- is, is enough oh. to stop most people. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Let alone them actually being able to open it properly because, right. <laughs> you know, do they have the right version? Well, I mean, maybe that's less so now. I just remember years ago, you know, if you didn't have the right version of it, then it wouldn't process the thing and it'll look funny and like it was just a disaster. And it's still an issue. Um, it, it's, it's an old yeah. issue, but it's still an issue. Yeah. Yeah. And actually now talking about that then, you know, we've got um, Excel, which we're using a lot, but clearly Word. I mean, there's still be a lot of SOAs and other advice documents being produced in Word. In terms of um, Excel, say, tables or graphs or anything like that, are most people like, you know, embedding or having a link through to advice documents for that? Are they screenshotting it and dumping it in? What's the way that you're seeing people sort of be the connector between those two things? It's mostly a just a screenshot into a Word document, into a template. Yeah. 
every now and then I'll see, you know, a, a merged chart from Excel, which I actually quite like because yep. if you're going to make any changes, you know, they're reflecting the Word document straight away. Um, yeah. But I think it's more, not so much that people just don't do it. I think it's just that they're not aware of how it works or what it actually does and how it, you know, yeah. plays within the Word document once they make changes in Excel. Um, but that's yeah. something that I, you know, it was one of the first things that I was trained on when it came to transferring data from Excel to Word was to was to link it um, so that, you know, any mm. changes I made, you know, the data was correct in both, in both versions. Right. Yeah. And it's it's quite a cool little thing because it's almost like you've got a little portal from your Word document yeah. that's a portal for a certain bit of the spreadsheet um, for whatever the thing is that you want to capture. but. Yep. Anything that goes on in that linked spreadsheet will then feed through, and your portal will be updated. Yes. You know, and it's yeah. it's if done well. I mean, you'd probably need if you're going to do it with a lot of documents over time. You'd probably need the two templated linked ones set up, and then what you'd copy yes. them or yep. something so that you could before you started using them that the new ones weren't linked to an old Excel spreadsheet. It's linked to a new one. Is that valid? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know, yeah. the other rule always is if you're going to do that is. You know, before it goes to client, before you, whatever you're doing with it, um, is to once you make sure that your data is correct, you break the links, and then you just got the static chart or data, whatever is yeah. in your Word document. But yeah, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. Okay. And so that's a valid thing. So it's like using it connected, and then once that is no longer valid because it's actually a a document that has a date, effectively, yep. like it's a you know it's got a point in time. Break the link so that that isn't likely to then change it, and that's just a a nice um you know sort of um sanitation of the way you do things and, and making it clean. So that's a good tip yeah. actually um, to just do that as part of your process. I mean, I'm also a bit of a freak with that stuff. Everything that's a point in time, I'm just always PDFing. Yeah. Like it's just my way yeah. of locking something. Like a time <laughs> Right, print yeah. to PDF. Yeah. It is. It is. And it means you just don't ever get that instance where somebody finds it, opens it, starts changing it, forgot to copy it first. You know, like the, all these things that we all do. Yep. Right, we all do it, um, and and make those mistakes. So, then in Word, let's just chat about that because I mean, we've even though we don't live in Word as much, we have had to use it, and so I spend a bit of time in the template section of Word, and I've got to say, there's a lot you can yeah. do at that level. That then, when you open a document, even a document that's been spat out by another system. If you open it within the template, it'll be like, whoa, we know what that's meant to look like. And it's sort of just sort of fixed all headings and layouts and all that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's, even though it's a bit fiddly, I don't know whether you found it fiddly, but it is a bit fiddly to set up once done, once okay. done right, then it can be quite powerful and save a bit of a yeah. time, bit of time, yeah. can't it? Templates, I, I advocate for templates. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Word. I have, you know, I've used Word for very, very, very many years. Um, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of templates, you know, one, because it keeps, you know, everything consistent, but two, it just automates so much. There is just so much capability to yeah. automate and, you know, set themes so that you, you know, can brand your document and your colours and your fonts and your headings and everything, everything, the whole layout. So whatever spits out, yeah, it's just doing it for you. Yeah. You know? And why wouldn't yeah. you want that? Like, if you can do that, why wouldn't you? A hundred percent. And I mean, even things that um, things that I discovered actually were, and I'm going to describe this wrong because it's been a little while since I've used it in Word, but the use of a thing like a watermark. So it's it's something that's almost behind that you want. So if you don't just want the static A4 page and you want something that's got like a curved nice yep. edge or maybe even a diagram that's like the background diagram you're going to then do lots to, but it's got this basic yep. layout, then you can put that in as a watermark that's in right. a page. And so- It'll just be there on every page, and so if you do four versions of that because it's four pages long, it'll just it'll just do it. You know, you don't have to try and drag it and then drag text over the top and it moves. And you know that I mean, one of the things I struggle with in any of these tools, Excel, Google Docs, any of them, is the whole I put something in, it shifts yep. things down. You're trying to line them up like yep. that rubbish yep. drives me nuts, <laughs> right? <laughs> So if you want to see me throw a computer out the window, it's when I've got to spend time on that rubbish. And so anything that takes that out of the the challenge, you know, the problem, and I find doing logos, so if you want your logo on a page, on every page or everything but the front page, then the watermark sort of style just lets you do that so easily so it doesn't mess with anything. Yeah, and again, this is where um, I like templates because you can set the layout and you can lock that layout so yeah. that, you know, like, and, and you know, I, I it's even the most experienced word user, will complain about moving an image because, you, you know, you move it a millimetre, <laughs> you know, three new pages are created before you've even realised. 
you know, it's, right. it's just oh it's insane. No, stop. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, trying to undo that is just as hard. So, you know, I, I'm all for templates. Um, you know, we just why, again, why wouldn't you? It just it's there. It's um, you know, they're really easy to create, and really, you know, big fan. And and look, and I think something we like lots of us probably aren't aware of is um, the consumer. You know, our client um, structure in documents helps us absorb yeah. the information. So the more that there's a certain type of heading that's a certain font size and color that you know, triggers whatever it could be triggers like these are the action items or these, this is another section or this is whatever it is. The more structure you have like that, that you stick to, then the easier any document is to absorb. Yeah. Um, Um, It's really important. And I think some people think it's just nitpicking, like when they get comments back, you know, and somebody's like, oh, that font's off or this is, it's like, no, 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 this is about making it easy for this to be consumed. It's it's also about accessibility. And this is something that, um, I learned, you know, in a lot of detail when I worked at Defence, particularly around Word documents, it's about, you know, when you've got consistency, when you've got, you know, when you've got a 30-page, 60-page document, um, you know, it needs breathing room, it needs consistency, you know, your eye needs to kind of, it needs to be broken up enough so that, you know, you're you're not getting fatigued reading this whole thing. Um, and, you yeah. know, accessibility, you know, one, obviously, it's, you know, so that anybody can read it and it's not complicated, confusing or whatever. But two, it's just so, you yeah. know, your readers aren't losing interest and they're not missing, you know, the key points yeah. that you're trying to highlight. And, you know, Correct. it's also just professional, you know. It just looks nice when it's, yeah. you know, nicely laid out and you don't have three different fonts with three different sizes everywhere. Yeah. And, look, I think, you know, the other thing that um, we can all do better, I think, is, and it's it's always the challenge I've had, and it, to be fair, this has changed a lot in recent years, but the problem I've had with the SOA templates that would get sp- bat out of any of the systems is, you know, yeah. they're hideous. Yep. I mean, it's <laughs> they're really, <laughs> really hideous. And when you look at a document that you absorb, really, you know, when you see something, you're like, wow, that's really well laid out and looks great and I can quickly absorb that information. I find things like like the um, McCrindle guys, actually, when they do one of their reports and it comes out and there's an icon for each thing and it's just really easy. It's almost sort of infographic style. Yep. You know, it's got that sort of feel where it's easy yep. to follow. You know, we don't do that enough in our documents. And I'm not just talking advice documents. It could even be in the letters or the updates we're sending on other things. You know, do you have an icon for each key type of information you give so that the client learns, hey, this is a market update bit, so it's got a little icon that's about markets. Or like start to use these repetitive signaling in our documents. And it's a conversation that I have quite often when I'm creating word templates for clients where they, you know, where I kind of suggest that maybe, you know, this bit could be in a table or this could be a graphic in Word document. And there's this kind of this worry that it won't look professional if it's got too many, you know, pretty pictures in it. And, you know, it, it's an interesting one because there's this, yeah. there's just this fear that, you know, the client will think that it's not professional if it's got, you know, little icons and pictures and, you know, lots of tables and, right. you know, lots of colour and things like that. When in fact, I believe it's the opposite. Yes. I really do. Um, you know, it keeps you engaged. Me too. Like I said, when you've got a 30-page document, that's a lot. And if that is just purely text, I would lose uh-uh. interest after the second page, you know, let alone 30 pages. <laughs> There's years ago, and I don't know if it's the textbooks are still around and I'm probably going to get his name wrong. I think, so Foyne at Maths in New South Wales, um, they probably call it something different yeah. now, but, you know, high-level maths. Um, the textbook was written by a guy called Coronius, I think it was his name, and it used a a script font, yep. and there was no difference to the font. Heading, no indent, no, like it was a stream of consciousness, consciousness this entire textbook full Oof. of mathematical formulas. And what was interesting about it is the trauma, it, it, like that can be a connecting point <laughs> to any new person you interact with. If they happen to mention, like they're my sort of age and they did maths, I'm like, oh, remember Coronis? Oh, my God, I the know. Trigger. Like it's this traumatic thing that's <laughs> – Right. And we really got to, you know, think about who does this stuff well. I mean, even annual reports by, say, you know, companies listed on the stock exchange, they spend a fortune getting those done because they recognize they're trying to communicate important concepts to people. And it's a lot and there's a lot of data, but they've got to try and get across great messages. So I'm with you. I think we don't expend enough energy 
on making the look and feel look much better. And in that sense, my understanding is Word can look far more like a brochure yeah. than it ever did. It's not just word processing now, right? There's a lot of ways that you can really Absolutely. make it look fantastic. Um, I think they just recently introduced a designer menu option as well where you can, you know, I okay. think it's, I'm pretty sure it's an AI-powered little designer option where, you know, yep. you can have a really, really basic, you know, horrible-looking little document and it'll make suggestions, you know, it'll actually create little designs for you and go, hey, you know, do you want one of these? You know, but absolutely, yep. you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of creativity, I think, in these. And, you know, when you're no competing for attention, for your client's attention, when they, you know, they're overwhelmed with information, it's not just you giving them a document, it's, you know, 30 other people, you know, super fun no. investments, you know, catalogues, all this stuff, you've got to make it engaging enough that they're going to take the time and have a look at it. You know? Otherwise, yep. it'll just be on the pile with everything else. Yep. Um, and, and, you know, it demonstrates care. Like if you've bothered to make this thing look good, it demonstrates care. The trick is that you don't have to build right. it from scratch That's every time. exactly right. <laughs> so, and, and, right, and if, listener, if you are this person that is part of your role, unless you are literally a PA or EA, and even then I would argue um, that there should be a lot of automation or templating or whatever you could do in your role. Unless that's literally your role is producing just the document judging, you know, the <laughs> turning it into looking good thing, then, you know, please expend some energy in working out how you can, yes, make it look better, but how you can do it without taking any extra yep. time, in fact, less time. Because it's ludicrous. We've all, I mean, if nothing else, it'll just free up more time yep. to spend with your clients. You know, yep. if nothing else. Um, and I'm curious, actually, to that extent, is there anybody you've seen that's done some clever stuff that, say, is a spreadsheet that they're using that they share on screen with clients or anything like that? Like, is anybody getting clever about cool graphs or cool ways of representing data? Because there is a lot more graphical options in Excel than there ever used to be. Like, there's a lot more way to represent data than there ever used to be. Uh, not that I've seen. And this is where I think a lot of people will then go and rely on, you know, like an online platform modeling where they can kind of right. get, you know, some, bring something up on screen really quickly. Not so much in Excel. The only other thing I've seen is people dump information into Canva to show pretty pictures to their client. Right. Um, but I think that's a, yes. I feel like that's a really complicated way when it comes to, you know, complex data. Um, but yeah, yes. not, so, not so much in Excel, not anymore. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it's the the Excel is the complex stuff. Yeah. Um, and the the analysis, maybe some business um, tools, but you know, I, I look. The thing I would say about <laughs> Excel is, you know, if you're somebody that lives in it, so if you're somebody that's using it on a regular basis, then you could absolutely do worse than picking one menu item a month, as in one tab along the top a month and each week you're just going to go down and find something you've never used before and Google it for a YouTube video and just watch what that does yep. because we are using 0.1% of these yeah. things. We think we are experts and we simply are not. <laughs> no. Not. No, <laughs> but, you know, like you just said, there there is just a wealth of information available to users now. Um, you yeah. know, even if you learn 20% of it, you'll be much further ahead yeah. than a lot of people. And it'll save you a lot of yeah, time. Yeah, and I think it really will. And and I think the other thing that's that's actually a downfall these days. So I'm showing my age here, but when we were using the twenty oh far out, nearly thirty years ago that I was in that little analyst chair working 120 hour weeks, uh, bleary eyed <laughs> at three a.m. staring at a spreadsheet. It's not the right time to be doing that stuff. I might add, uh, tired and caffeined and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you know, when we were doing that, you could buy a book that had every function in Excel mm -hmm. and it had one per page and you could scan them to go, look, I need to do this particular yeah. thing and I need a function that yeah. will fit it. Um, and it lets you sort of browse yeah. really easily. And it's the weakness of online help functionality is when you know what you're looking for, mm -hmm. you're fine. If you can describe what you want to do, when you're not yeah. sure, it's very hard yep. to browse. Yep. Right, it's very hard to sort of go. Oh, that sounds pretty cool. Why don't I play with yep. that? This um, is, you know, which is what. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say this is where um, 
And I actually, I, I was working on a spreadsheet not that long ago and I was frustrated and it was my, my 14-year-old son who went, well, why don't you put it into chat GPT and ask it? <sighs> and it was then that I went, actually, yes. And it solved my problem within you know, 10 seconds flat to just dun, go, dun, dun. <laughs> here's what I'm trying to do. You know, here's part of my formula. Here's what I want it to look like. Can you please fill in the rest? And it just kind of went, sure. And that was it. It's wow. In, yeah. Highly recommend. Okay. Okay. <laughs> and particularly as, as um, you know, that meets the sort of sniff test for ChatGPT, meaning there's no client data going in. There's no, right. there's nothing that you need to protect. This is asking it a generic question. That's right. Um, for a generic formula. You know, it, it meets all of those tests. And I think the pe- the other thing that people don't fully grasp, and I hadn't, I'll, I'll admit I hadn't either, is so you ask it a question, you get something back and you're like, oh, that wasn't what I was looking for. The way to respond to that in chat DP is to write, that wasn't quite what I was looking yes. for. Yes. Can you please redo it for blah, blah, blah? Yes. So talk to it like you would a human being in that instance. And yep. generally on the second crack, it's fine. Yeah. You know, it gets it done. Yep. And this is where um, uh, I, I've, yeah, that's where I was kind of worried. Initially, I stopped using ChatGPT because I'd get the wrong answer or not what I was looking for. And you kind of go, oh, well, right. it doesn't really get it. I've now learned and I have had four conversations with ChatGPT where it's like, no, you need to try again. <laughs> yeah. No, this is not what I asked you to do. Please stop responding yeah. and try again. You know, like you said, just speak to it as though you're speaking to a help desk or whoever it is, you know, and trying to get a solution from. Um, yeah. You know, second or third go. And being, being specific. Yeah. Give it as much context as humanly possible. Yep. Um, and it, that will mean it because it's it's only it, it can only learn from what's out there. And if you make it too general, then it's got too much to choose from. That's right. That's right. Right. So undoubtedly, it's going to be wrong. Yep. <laughs> what are the odds? You know. So yep. that's that's interesting. Are you finding many people using or you you or yourself using um, ChatGPT when we're trying to describe something and we just don't feel like we've nailed the description? So it could be a description of a of a strategy or a, or you know a market environment or something like that where the words we're coming up with we recognize are a bit stilted or just really aren't as succinct as we like are anybody you know are you seeing anybody feeding that into chat gbt to try and get something out that maybe is a bit clearer uh more and more people are doing that obviously there's yep. you know there's that concern about putting anything in there that's that's quite sensitive um but when it's just Correct. a generic paragraph you know like right. you said, when you're trying to just describe strategy, you know, in, in, in a generic kind of form, I think yep. it's perfectly okay. And more and more people are doing that. And I certainly, you know, I, I use ChatGPT quite regularly. And it's just for those times when, like you said, you just can't, you can't get the words out or, yeah, you know, I just need some suggestions on, you know, how would you say this or, you know, is this grammatically correct? And just those kind of, you know, save yourself, yep. you know, 10 minutes of just, you know, intense kind of brain trauma and just dump it in there and yeah you know yeah see what it comes up with and and look I'd also encourage um <laughs> I've actually had a lot of fun with this where you know okay you know describe a whatever strategy remembering that it probably knows most of the strategies so most of the more fundamental strategies we all use it it probably knows about right yeah. because they're, they're in the interweb yeah. so so it probably knows about them so you know describe um transition to retirement like I'm a 10 year old mm-hmm use a story that a 10-year-old in Australia would understand as an analogy for, like start to, and if you've got a client that's of a certain background, maybe they grew up in Britain in the war or like whatever Mm -hmm. it is, tell it that and ask it how it would describe this thing. And it's not that you use these things verbatim, but it can give you some wonderful storytelling or context. We're like, oh, I can run with that. You know, what can I do with that thing? So I do think that, and I'm, excited actually to hear to use it for Excel formulas. That's a great idea yeah. um, to sort of solve a problem you're trying to fix. And I've heard of people doing that for quite complicated ones, yep. you know, not just some basic stuff. Yeah, oh, um, look, I've, you know, I, I've dumped some really complex Python code in there and just, you know, so can you can you just help me resolve or have a look at this and please tell me, you know, where's a needle in the haystack? Um, yeah. You know, if it's going to save me two hours of stress, fantastic. Right. <laughs> It's at least a place to start. And then exactly. if you can't do it, well, fine. We'll use another That's technique. Right. Then I'll test for two hours, but, you know. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Let's try and avoid that if at all humanly That's possible. Right. What, what about integration? So, 
Word and Excel have been around for, well, we've established a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, How much opportunity is there to either use triggers from other tools or integrate them with other things that people might be using on a daily basis? I think, and this is, I'm actually writing an article I have it at the moment called Why Word is My MVP and Will Forever Be because it integrates yeah. into so many different platforms. You know, okay. um, I my gosh, it, it's just one of those things that just seems to work with with everything. Um, it, it's very rare that you can't extract something into some form of a Word document or, you know, whether it be a .doc or a .rtf or just some form of a yep. editable Word document. Um, and, you know, Word document, same, yep. same as with Excel, you know, whether it be using what's in Excel to import data into a platform or to export data, you can in some format, you know, import and imp- and export that data. That's why I love them. I just think they, you know, they tried and true and tested and they've just been around for so long and they will continue to be, you know, the MVP for yeah. a lot of people, me included, because I just feel that they're so versatile. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And there's a lot of things. I mean, we've discovered discovered this with um, with G Suite, but I'm sure it would apply to all of the appropriate Microsoft tools like OneDrive and others. Mm-hmm. Is you can set it up to do a whole lot of automation things, like when you set up a new type of folder, it automatically puts these templated documents in there ready that are empty to go with. You yep. know, like it can do a whole lot of these things that you're manually doing. Yep. Um, that you can teach it just to repeat it, something you're doing. So if you're doing something that's from here to here to here to here and it's within the Microsoft suite, I would go, I would search that and I'd go on YouTube and see if you can connect that and make it an automation because I bet you oh, can. Oh, absolutely. And, you know? you know, Microsoft is now quite heavily releasing a lot of automation and a lot of these little features where you can connect all your different you know, yeah. productivity tools, as we said before, um, you know, yeah. where it can go through all your information and connect your workflow end to end, right to yeah. right down to. I think yeah, there's a tool. I'm not sure what it's called, but you can literally, you know, just kind of go. I want, you know, as soon as an email comes in from Outlook, I want these things to be done and Word to open and Excel to open. And, you know, Teams to do this yeah. and Calendar to schedule this. Um, yes, you know, absolutely. Google it. Um, I, I, you know, yeah. There's there's so much of it, and you will be stunned how much of your time it frees up. Yeah, like it's just ludicrous once you start becoming aware of these things. Yeah. Now we've we have chatted a bit about AI. So speaking of AI, you guys have a program you've put together that's for I guess advisors or power planners yeah. really. That's about you know SOAs and AI. So what sort of thing can they learn in there that you think would be valuable that could really add some add some oomph to what you know they're doing on a day to day basis? Yeah, and again, it was. Um you know, when we started looking at this and, you know, we started looking at AI when OpenAI kind of was released late last year and, um, you know, how can we start using this and what can we do with this and, you know, really is it is it something that we're going, you know, is it going to be a big thing or not? And then we started looking at, you know, well, how can you, you know, optimise the statement of advice because that was a question that we started then getting quite a lot, you know, what can I do with AI, yeah. particularly around SOAs because that's, you know, quite a big bug there in terms of yeah. time for a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, I started looking at this thing and, you know, optimizing it in terms of layout and, you know, accessibility and, you know, language. Um, so, you know, there's a section about, you know, rewording things just so that they're not so, you know, technical jargon and, you know, complicated. Yep. Uh, there's a section on, you know, layout. So how can I make this three pages worth of just plain text into something that's broken into something that somebody actually wants to read and so yeah you know there are prompts about you know dumping all this text and making a table for example a bullet yep. point um yeah you know so it's all just it's not so much about you know the strategies and the advice itself it's more just about the layout and just making it something that your client as we've discussed you know that makes it more mm. engaging that your client wants to look at um yeah and, you know, part of that was kind of done with the QAR in mind as well, you know, going forward, if the SOA is going to, you know, no longer be or it's going to be something different or something shorter, you know, could you use some tools to, you know, to make it something different and what that look yeah. like and, you know, yeah. what can it actually do? Um, yeah, it's, and we've had, yeah, quite, sure. we've had quite a lot of interest, quite a lot of <laughs> uptake. We've had quite a few people do the course. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's just a quick little 40-minute kind of you know, out of your day to run through it and then you've just got it forever. You've got access to it forever and play around as much as you want. 
Look, and I think anything that, look, some people like me are just going to use them and break them. That's how I learn, right? So I just sort of, <laughs> I mean, I'm even doing a little program that's about um, image generation in AI, right? Yeah. I'm really fascinated about the opportunity to get a photo shoot that means I'm never in front of a camera. Like this appeals yeah. to me immensely, <laughs> right? I'm like, that's fantastic. You know, I'm going to go out and learn how to do this so that then I can have an adventure out there or I can be a spaceman or like, like all of that to me sounds awesome. Um, but I do think most people actually aren't like that. So they don't want to actually dive in. So anything that can give you that, it's a little bit of confidence, isn't it? It's like, okay, learn enough that then you will start playing with it and you'll start to see more application over time. Um, Expecting, honestly, if you're not using um, AI sort of on a semi-regular basis by now, doing something like this will, will help a lot. Um, and yeah. like, it's so pervasive now. In fact, as of today, I've added an extra question for every interview now that just covers AI because mm-hmm. it applies everywhere now. Yeah. It's not something that do you think you might get there? Whereas a year ago, oh, do you think you'll ever fold in AI to the system now? It's like, so how are you? Yeah. Cause everybody <laughs> is right. It's like, well, no matter what happened is, how are you going to use AI? Right. What's your use for it? Yeah. So it is here to stay. It is not. It, yes, it has some challenges, but it absolutely has some application that could be really powerful. Yeah, and, um, and I think you know if we're smart, I, I think that's that's the you know conversation. I don't, I don't think it should be treated as you know some issue that needs to be resolved, and you know we make it disappear. No. Um, you know it is here to stay. People will <laughs> use it, whether you know people like it or not. It, it is being used. Um, you know my my kids use it. You know I've had emails from school about it. It's it, yeah, it is. You know community wide um, and so yeah if you can you know start to use it in a way that is comfortable for you i think that's a good starting point yeah you know just yeah start looking into it and look if you if you ever catch yourself you know doing this sort of railing against it you know and it's this it's going to pass this you know sorry it's it's, it's a bit of a flash in the pan Very. thing uh uh, what I would say to you is that in doing that, you are dangerously mimicking all of our parents who thought TV was going to rot our brain when we were watching Rage and first thing in the morning on a Saturday or whatever. Yes. Like it's just, it's here to stay. This is not something that you're going to be able to anger away. This is, it's just not that, right? right? It's a, it's a given. What's, what we need to do is work out how we can make ourselves bionic by using this sort of thing. Like what can we That's right. and it's- enhance? If it's all about working with it, yeah. um, you know, learning how you can use it to optimize whatever it is that you're trying to achieve. That's yep. all it is. You know, and I know when I started power planning, everything I did was with a calculator. And, yeah. you know, I was told then that, you know, there will be nothing to replace. You know, it's just You're always gonna have to do this manually. This that's is right. just yeah. It will always be a manual process and, you yeah. know, there will be nothing else that yeah. I, I remember the last time I touched a calculator. It's just to that end, yeah. actually, there is a lot of discussion about, oh, it's the end of power planners, and like, which I just think is hysterical because, well, I find I find when people say those sort of things, it's um, it's this sweeping statement. And what I do yeah. think is all of these tools, so the analysis tools and how far they're going now, even with scenarios they can do with a click, you know, all this sort of stuff does change what each role does, but my expectation actually, and given what we've been talking about actually today that power planners are going to end up needing to be better communicators. Like I think their skill could be here's this yeah. complex thing and they're going to become really good at creating great ways to communicate those messages, you know. So it's that's going to become an art is how do you make this really easily absorbable and clear and like that and particularly with QAR, right, when we're not yep. restrained by these ridiculous documents then yep. the power planner can be the one that can be that sort of lens from the client's perspective. How can we make this easy to understand? How can we communicate this message? Absolutely. And I think this, you know, I mean, power planning, you know, has has evolved how many times over yeah. and over throughout the years. And I think this is just another iteration of that. And I think what an opportunity to evolve and kind of go, right, well, how can I use this for my job, you know, and how can I, you know, how will my role now shift in, into into what will it evolve into, but not in a bad way? Yeah. I just, I genuinely believe that this is an opportunity to leverage, you know, new technology. And in yes. 10 years, we might see something else that, you know, is feels a lot scarier than this. Yes. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that this is an opportunity to, you know, take it and run with it and see, 
you know, what it can do for you and what you can learn and yeah. what changes you can make in, in power planning. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So is there anything we sort of missed in terms of the magic of Word and Excel? Any other tips or or things you'd point people towards that they should check out that's things you've seen that's like, wow, that really blew my socks off? Anything else do you feel that we should cover off? I don't think so. Um, I think it's one of those, you know, they're not kind of new shiny tools. They're not no. these exciting things anymore. But, you know, I think they're definitely worth attention and learning. I think they'll be around for a long time. They will continue to evolve and, you know, with the advent of AI, um, you know, I think those tools will, you know, be a bit more flashy, but there is a reason why they've stuck around for so long and I think they're worth learning to use well or to the best of your capabilities. Um, Yeah. You know, it it won't fail you and, you know, I've been able to transfer my Word and Excel skills into every role I've ever had um, and will continue to do so. And yeah. Don't and dismiss you, them. No, and, and I think, you know, bothering to understand the other tool, like most people will have a Microsoft suite of some fashion that yeah. is part of their, their role that they've been given and they'll be using a handful of them, maybe Out, Outlook and Word and Excel might be the core mm-hmm. and then a few others. Yeah. Um, bother to look at what else is there because sometimes there's this clever thing. I've seen some people use forms in a really clever way to feed into Word docs that do the – so you don't have to go and try and find all the places you've got to change something to look for a client's name or, you know, like there's clever things you can do by connecting a few of these tools so that then, yeah. you know, you can save yourself some inordinate amount of time. Yeah, and it's just more than anything just, you know, to have that curiosity, just be curious about it and if you come across yeah. something – you know, you can't really, you can't break the program itself. You know, you might, you know, mess up a document, but be curious and just press yeah. buttons and see what they do. And if you're not sure, like you said, you know, Google it, YouTube it, yeah. you know, yeah. see what you can do with it. And and I would, yeah, I would really encourage any listener, like if you are using these tools at all, really, like in a week, if you don't, you know, if you're using Word and Excel at all, then I would find a YouTube, a couple of YouTube channels that you just find have a lot of this and start following them because yeah. what they'll do is they'll have the latest update and then they'll give, like, there'll be a short little video that'll show you the latest stuff. These companies are now, for a while, my take was Microsoft was lagging in terms of new stuff, you know, yeah. like they'd, They'd, you know, just they'd give it another number. So it was the, you know, the 19 version of this and the 20 and the whatever. But there wasn't significant difference in the functionality each time. Whereas they are, I would argue, probably gone beyond catching up. They're now actually starting to sort of surpass a whole lot of other tools. And they are going hard. They're investing seriously. So keep up to date with what they're releasing. Yeah. Because they're doing it for people like us. (laughs) Worker bees, yeah. right? They're trying to help out worker bees um, because they know that's their market. So try to find some a couple of YouTube channels you like, you like the way they describe things, that they keep up to date on those updates and and subscribe to those channels. Yeah, couldn't um, agree and more. I think it'll, yeah, it'll, do, it'll serve you really well. All right, folks. Now, the other thing I'd say is Microsoft now have, or sorry, uh, I believe in final beta testing are about to roll out um, their version of an AI called Copilot, and this would sit embedded within their suite of tools. So as opposed to what we were just describing, where you sort of go to another tool, and and there are actually actual ways that people have actually added in things like ChatGPT into Excel and Word, um, and there's some concerns about the privacy and all sorts of things of, of data and information for that. But what Microsoft have done is their own AI. Um, we're getting somebody on the show to talk through what that might look like so that we can all sort of get a bit of a heads up of what might be possible um, so that when it goes live, we can all, you know, click our heels and get done in one day what currently takes five. So, <laughs> so hope, fingers crossed that's what they deliver. Um, <laughs> but um Advice Explorers, if you would like to find out more about this sort of clever tricks and tips about the SOA and IA Masterclass, then Katie's, the website link will be in the episode along with her LinkedIn details. Mm -hmm. Um, Thank you so much for joining us here today to cover something just you know, I guess so general and and something we're so used to using. Um, I really appreciate being able to have a chat and talk about all the different elements that might be available for people to check out. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your time. I really enjoyed it. Okie dokie. So <laughs> normally at this point, just before giving my thoughts, I suggest, hey, are you a current user of this app? Well, 
we're talking Word and Excel here, so I'm betting most of you are. And if it's not, if you're not a user of Word and or Excel, it's because you're a user of Google Doc and Sheets or equivalent version thereof. Um, <clears throat> I'm hoping that at the very least, this conversation has prompted you to rethink learning more about those tools. I think we can all get very used to what we've used them for to date, not realizing that we have some Formula One cars that we're sitting there using like they're a moped, right? So if I can encourage you, please um, start to investigate what else these tools can do. Now, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, and YouTube truly is your friend here. So I just spent a couple of seconds and went into YouTube and typed in um, Excel and VBA, right? I just went, all right, you know, I mean, what can we use this for? Is there some tutorials? And I came across a YouTube page called Kenji Explains, that's K-E-N-J-I. And, you know, he had even some little tutorials just on how you know, you could build a couple of things. One could be, all right, you use this sheet all the time, but at the end of the week, you then wipe out the data and you enter it in again, right? So it's the same sheet you use over and over again. Then you can set up just a button that when you click it, will just clear the data in a table. Easy, right? Super easy. And what it'll actually do for you, if you want to, you could code it such that when you click the button, it sort of does the, are you sure, right? Which we all love. There's some just some things where you're like, do you really want to do this? So it will do a little pop-up. Another one I really liked actually that he has an example of is you've got a spreadsheet you use or type. Maybe there's something you update that then gets sent around to the team to take a look at. This is something you regularly do with this particular spreadsheet. Then you can add an, a button using VBA. You can add a button in that Excel spreadsheet that when you click on it will automatically open up an email with the spreadsheet attached with certain code and to certain people and you can just check it and then click send. So I know that says, oh, but Peter, is it really that many clicks for me to do that myself? Well, no, it's not. But if you are regularly doing these things and you can find multiple examples of the of ideas for this type of these type of little ninja tricks and shortcuts, you will gradually add more and more time you're freeing up. And if you do this really well, we are talking you could free up a whole day a week. Like this can become a massive impact on your day. So I'd encourage you to go into YouTube, check out Excel and VBA or Excel tips or 2023 Excel tips. Similarly, Word tips 2023 or even Word designer, you know, tips if you haven't, weren't aware that there was something that could help you design. I mean, just in my quick look, you know, I discovered you can drag, a, you know, you can open a PDF in Word and it will convert it all to text that you could then edit or drag some of that um, content and use it elsewhere and even an image. So if you've got an image that's got some stuff in it that you really like and you want that, you want that text, then you just copy that image into Word, save it as a PDF and then open it again in Word and it'll convert all of that into text. So there's a number of these tricks, right, that could really make your life easier. So I would encourage you to use YouTube. It To me, it's the, it's the du jour of the place to find these. Um, so that's the first thing I'd encourage you to do. Find and follow some of these people that just provide constant updates. The second thing is if you are regularly living in any of these tools, then I'd take a look at the menu items at the top. You know, there's all those, there's a couple of what, it, whether it might be file view, whatever the, the items at the top, assign them one to a month. And then, you know, once a week, you're going to spend some time checking out some of the features you've never clicked on under that menu item for that month, right? So you're going to allocate an hour or whatever once a week. And this month, it's about the file menu. And we're going to go through and you're going to check out a feature item. And then you go in and either play with it in, say, Excel, or you just go into YouTube and say, you know, explanations for this feature in Excel, right? And or uses for and that sort of thing. So really start to dig, use things like ninja tricks or, um, you know, creative uses for these sort of search terms will give you some great ideas um, and systematically work your way through the menu items. I am I am confident you will find a whole lot of things that are going to make your life easier. And if you're feeling particularly generous, can I ask that you share them on the Ensemble Community Platform because all of us could benefit from those. So please, as you discover these ninja tips, please share them with the rest of the community. Now, 
The other thing I'd just add to that I see a lot, and, and some of this is just old school stuff, right? So feel free to ignore if you like, but file naming when we've got these files can get a bit loosey goosey um, and people can name things a bit randomly and they can be potentially um, maybe difficult to find when say you've got a subfolder, you've got some things sitting under. So it might be multiple sheets or um, multiple, you know, word documents. So um, one thing that, that this was a carryover from years and years ago when I was an analyst is the reverse date naming method. So that's something you do at the beginning of a file it's the date and you can choose, is it the date you create it? Is it the date you finalize it? Whatever it is to you. But so today is the 7th of September, 2023. So the reverse date naming method would be 20230907. Space, dash space, and then the name of the file, maybe even the client's name and the name, whatever you like. But if you do it that way, it will perfectly order in any folder. So they'll always be in date order. Whereas if you date it the the other direction, so 07092023, then stuff gets mixed up, right? Because of the ways that it, the, our months and the way we name things. So reverse date order is a little ninja tip that could make life a whole lot easier for you. Um, the other thing I'd say is in a client folder, consider having event folders as subfolders for a client rather than having advice docs and then, you know, I do or whatever, like those folders having, you know, the reverse date review. So if it was done for, for September, 20230901 dash any review and under that fo- subfolder are all the documents. You you may find that event-based folders could serve all of your team much better and it meant that, you know, it's not going to mean that the, all, the advisors only know where those things are and the support team only know where these things are. It's like everybody can find things at all time. So I just wanted to share that. It's just another little trick on making things easier to hand over and easy to share amongst us. But please, if you find a YouTube channel that rocks for this stuff, please share it with everybody. Um, we'd all love to see it, uh, as would, I definitely would <laughs> love to hear about it. Ooh, now we're down to that time again. As you know, there's only one skill we need to become bionic advisors, and that is avid curiosity. Now, to help you with that habit this week, today's Curiosity Corner, site is is something really interesting. And this is one of those, hey, you just need to have a bit of a play. This is about experiencing what technology is doing out there, as opposed to something that's really going to rock your world. This is not in the rock your world category, folks, right? This is a bit of fun. So the one I'd like you to take a look at is called Pi. You can find it at pi.ai forward slash talk. And Pi is your personal AI assistant. This is basically a chatbot that you can ask questions of, you can have a conversation about, it'll ask you about what things you like to do in your spare time and it'll it'll dive deeper into that. It'll have all sorts of insights. Hey, which version of that book do you like? Did you like, oh, what are the ones you recommend? Did you know there's another one? Like it's this just, you know, it's a virtual chat buddy. And people that get into this end up, you know, finishing the night saying, good night, pie, you know, I'm off to sleep. Like this is becomes somebody that they're interacting with. Part of the reason I'm recommending this is so that we can all start to be more aware of what's out there, more aware of the way tools can be utilized and the way AI is being, AI is being applied. Um, the more you can experience this, then the more you can start to think about how with a different AI behind it, a different sense, set of data it's drawing from, what could we all build that might help the you know, Australian public get you know better in touch with their money and their future. So this is great fun. It's called Pi. Check it out. And I'd love to hear how you find it. It is your own, it's a choose your own adventure story, folks. You just keep on talking to it, ask its advice about something, a choice you're about to, you're about to make or a difficult conversation you're going to have, see what it comes up with and then share it with the rest of the team. So enjoy. Welp, that's all we've got for this week. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you'll get your advice tech fix automatically sent to you each Friday. And if, you know, <laughs> listening to all this, despite loving loving the dulcet tones of Peter D, you're actually feeling a bit of tech overwhelm. You wonder whether you maybe need to streamline all the different tech that the business is using or you're using, then please feel free to either, you know, nudge your practice manager or maybe even, you know, a trainer in your dealer group and they can reach out to me as I've been doing a lot of sessions and workshops at conferences, sort of talking about this paradox of, of advice tech abundance and innovation, 
but its potential drawbacks, you know, and how applying a bit of advice tech minimalism in the way we work could actually add some value and what habits you're going to have to develop to make that possible. So if you're curious about that, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. That's forward slash Peter MD, P-E-I-T-A-M-D. And I'd love to have a chat. Otherwise, I'll look forward to turning up in your earbuds next week. And remember, advice explorers, stay curious. Oh, 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 o